Welcome to ONLA Webinars. I'm your host, Summer Mazur, and whether you're joining us live or on demand, ONLA thanks you very much for being with us. We have a great webinar for you today, so let's get started. Space Invaders, Biological Pollution and Its Threat to North American Trees with Dr. Eric Rebeck. Eric? Thank you, Summer. Thank you. It's good to be here, virtually at least. <laughs> Um, so yes, my name is Eric Rebeck. I'm the State Extension Specialist for uh, Horticultural Entomology. So all of those insects that uh, affect most of the plants you might grow in your landscape, including your trees. And so today uh, we are going to focus on um, invasive species, uh, particularly the insects that, uh, that we have to worry about. Uh, and we'll focus on a couple of, uh, of species in particular. But first we'll start with a, just a broad overview of what we're talking about and, and the impact that uh, invasive species can have on our trees. So uh, recall from the, the old video game from the 80s, uh, Space Invaders. Uh, that's the theme for, uh, uh, for what we're talking about today. I thought it was a nice uh, fit for talking about invasive species. We do need to worry about uh, the invasion um, and roots of invasion for a lot of, of exotic species in, that, that make their way into North America. And one way to think about invasive species is um, that they are biological pollution. Um, so there's a definition out there. There are several. This is just one that I uh, thought was, was perfect. Um, it's, it's, it's essentially a disturbance of the ecological balance by the accidental or deliberate introduction of a foreign organism into an environment. And we do see uh, both accidental as well as intentional introductions of, of exotic species for a wide variety of purposes. Um, foreign organisms can include animals, including insects, which we're going to focus on today, but also plant pathogens, um, both those that affect animals and, and those that affect plants, and then also plant um, invaders, uh, exotic weeds uh, that become problematic for us in our landscapes. Uh, to date, we're somewhere around the 4,500 mark, probably a few more than that, um, of exotic species that have become established in North America. So not all species that are introduced into a new area become established and then therefore become a problem ecologically. Um, they have to become established first. And so um, the rule is somewhere about 10% of all species that make their way in, across our borders actually become established and therefore become invasive. So 4,500 though is still a, a large number. And um, 400 of these are insects that feed on trees and shrubs. So this is a significant problem for our industry. And here's just a graphic showing uh, tracking by year going back to the 1600s, 1700s, you know, barely a blip in terms of the number of introductions into North America. But we see around 1800 or so, uh, that number starts to increase and it increases precipitously in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And, um, and, and these are the number of adventive species or exotic insect introductions um, that have become established. And um, due to this large number, uh, Congress in 1912 established the Plant Quarantine Act, uh, recognizing this as a significant problem. Um, and and they, established, they enabled this act in order to try to protect U.S. crops. But you can see that even beyond that, uh, that, that law going into effect, we still have this uh, the significant increase, this uh, steep incline in the number of invasive species uh, through the late 90s as far as this graph is. But this, this trend continues into the, to, into the 2000s. So when we're talking about exotic tree pests, uh, insects, they can include several different feeding guilds. Um, we can group them into the, their functional groups, what, what they do and, and how they feed. Um, so these include some wood borers, and today we're going to focus on two of these, um, emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle, but there are others, including a uh, smaller European elm bark beetle, which was responsible for, um, for widespread uh, establishment and spread of Dutch elm disease. And we all know the story behind that and the loss of millions of American elms as a result. Um, defoliators, including gypsy moth, and, and there are many others as well, just a well-known example there. And then um, also sucking pests, insects that have piercing sucking mouth parts, um, including balsam woolly adelgid and beech bark scale, which have been causing some, some um, devastation, somewhat limited in their geographic range in North America, but still uh, nonetheless in those areas, definitely uh, an ecological disaster. 
And again, the, 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 the effects of these invasive species establishing and, and, and feeding and attacking our trees is widespread and significant. Um, this is just an image uh, showing the invasion uh, front, uh, the, the wave, uh, the invasion wave, the front line, if you will, um, of gypsy moth. Um, so the caterpillars are kind of advancing and making their way, munching their way through this forest. So, um, you know, very, very significant defoliation in the middle of um, the growing season, right? So, you know, we wouldn't expect to see that kind of defoliation or that denuding of the canopy. And then uh, oftentimes, of, of course, with a lot of these invasive species, we see a lot of standing dead lumber and dead timber as a result of um, these invasive species uh, doing their thing, uh, attacking these trees and ultimately uh, killing them. So just, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres potentially uh, can be affected in this manner. And unfortunately for, for, for several of these species, uh, the only effective way to try to deal with it, at least in, try, in terms of trying to prevent further spread, is to remove these trees, to cut them down. And this, of course, is uh, at great expense um, and, and great effort. And that story is certainly true for Emerald Ash Borer, which is our first uh, focus case study today. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit of an update of what's going on with this species, uh, as well as how it's affecting us here in Oklahoma. So um, the scientific name, Emerald Ash Borer, Agryalis plana pennis. Uh, it is a buprested beetle. It's in the family Buprestidae, the jeweled beetles we call them. I think you can see why we call them jewel beetles. They are uh, very metallic and shiny, um, just gorgeous beetles just in their own right. But of course, the damage they do is not so pretty. Um, the, the immatures, um, we, we, we call them flat-headed borers. So there's a, just this the, the immatures of this family, of this group of beetles we call flat-headed borers, uh, due to their kind of shape and, and, and size. They're, they're very flattened um, from top to bottom, flattened like a pancake, uh, which is perfect for where they feed. They feed in the vascular tissues of trees, um, in that cambial layer, kind of in between the, um, the phloem and the xylem. Um, so they do affect the uh, transport of water and nutrients in the tree. And <clears throat> so, um, so that area where they feed, just under the bark, um, this, the shape of, of them, that, that very flattened uh, body, allows them to inhabit that area and feed there very, very readily. Uh, and then the adult beetles, um, you can see they're not very large at all. Um, in fact, we, we, it's very difficult without traps to really detect the beetles themselves. They're feeding in the upper canopy of the ash trees. Um, and and the, the foliation they cause is very insignificant. They you know, take little nips of leaves, so we don't really notice defoliation from the, from the adults. Um, and again, they're small size. They fit nicely within a penny. Um, so they're, they're not very readily observable without trapping methods. So a little bit briefly about the history and scope. Uh, this species arrived in North America from Asia, uh, likely in solid wood packing material uh, that either came in shipping cargo overseas or was transported uh, by airplane. Through uh, dendrochronology, which is the study of tree rings, um, they were able, to, uh, researchers in Michigan were able to detect that, uh, determine that emerald ash borer originally arrived in, uh, in Michigan in the mid 1990s. So it had been there for a long time prior to its initial dis uh, discovery in 2002, my next bullet point. Um, and this is very typical for a lot of our invasive species. We often don't know they are there um, until you know, some time has passed, a decade or more. Um, and we, we refer to that in invasive species ecology, we, re, we refer to that as the lag period. There's a lag between the initial introduction and the initial discovery of some of these species. And, and that's certainly true for emerald ash borer. So as I mentioned, 2002 was discovered in Southeast Michigan around the Detroit area, um, as well as across the river into Ontario, Canada in the city of Windsor. Uh, right away, the uh, state of Michigan um, quarantined 13 counties um, in, in southeast Michigan that were potentially affected uh, and infested, and, and indeed they were. And the nursery industry was hit hard. Um, the, the nurseries that were within those quarantine counties lost $10 million overnight. They could not ship out um, any more of their uh, ash stock as a result. So that was worth about $10 million just from those nurseries alone. 
Now, Emerald Ash Borer, of course, um, despite great effort in trying to contain the spread and eradicate the species, um, it, that is that that program has been abandoned. We're not talking eradication anymore. We're trying to figure out ways to deal with it uh, because it is here to stay. It is now found in 35 U.S. states and five Canadian provinces. So from that initial introduction point around Detroit, um, it has spread radially outward um, in, in all directions, um, affecting 35 U.S. states now and, um, and further reaching into Canada, further north and west. So um, this is a significant problem. Um, and I'll show you a map of the distribution in just a moment, including here in Oklahoma. Um, and here in Oklahoma, speaking of, it was first found near Grand Lake in October of 2016. So we've had this for uh, just over four years now um, in Oklahoma. But there's still good news about that, and I'll talk about it in just a minute. Um, the uh, USDA APHIS, which is the kind of the regulatory arm um, for, for plant uh, pest quarantine, trying to uh, um, reduce the, um, the impact of these species, trying to reduce their introduction in the first place, uh, at the border, so through border security um, and inspection of articles coming into the U.S. Um, there, that's what APHIS does, um, but they also are part of regulation for species that already are introduced. And, and so uh, together with state regulatory agencies, um, there's been quarantines enacted in, in many of these areas, in most of these areas where emerald ash borer has been found, um, trying to prevent further spread outward from those counties. Uh, in those areas. And um, regulated articles that are under quarantine include, I already mentioned one earlier, nursery stock. So any ash species cannot be moved out of the quarantine zone um, because that's a potential source of emerald ash borer into new areas. But also um, firewood, logs, green lumber, etc. Just about anything that you can harvest from ash if it's not treated, um, if it's not milled properly, um, or to, this, to the specifications of APHIS and others, uh, it, it, it cannot be moved. Firewood is a big problem. Uh, firewood, we see uh, a lot of these incipient populations, these new infestation areas, um, oftentimes they're in um, county parks, uh, county uh, uh, state forests and, and such. And uh, that, that tells us it, it likely got there from firewood. So the movement of firewood from a uh, for infested firewood from a from an area where emerald ash borer occurred uh, into that new area where they're um, and they didn't burn that wood they just left it so um, there's a lot of there's a firewood campaign a lot of effort into trying to get the word out with campers hunters fishermen uh, trying to you know make sure make sure that they buy that firewood on site rather than transporting it with them. To date, damages in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and this is largely in the realm of removal of trees, uh, replacing those trees with, with other species primarily, um, and then treatment, um, treatment costs. And the, aside from the economic devastation, the ecological devastation is very noticeable and significant as well. Hundreds of millions of dead and dying ash trees, our native ash uh, species, are certainly at risk um, of survival, um, certainly at risk of extinction from this particular uh, pest. Here's that map I said I was going to share with you, just showing the current distribution. Um, so these are just all the states and provinces um, that do have emerald ash borer, okay? Um, and, and the level of infestation in these different areas, it varies uh, quite a bit, um, but, um, but you can see that, you know, we, we do have some major impact and spread from this species. Um, so so it, is, it is out there and getting around, despite our, again, despite our best efforts to prevent it. So the, all these green areas um, are places where um, emerald ash borer has been confirmed. Um, and then other states just showed in light green are showing that folks are getting on board in other areas in preparation, um, getting information ready uh, for that day when Emerald Ash Borer does invade their borders. Um, closer to home, here's kind of our region, um, some surrounding states around Oklahoma showing that uh, um, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Missouri, Kansas, and even Colorado, a little uh, population, I, I believe that's around um, the Boulder area of Colorado, or it could be Fort Collins, I can't recall. Um, anyway, widespread, um, just a large distance between, um, you know, this, this main front of the invasion, right? Which tells us 
likely transport of firewood or some other means um, of regulated articles that were moved out of a quarantine zone um, that that ended up in that uh, in that area of Colorado. Um, jumped a, a state entirely before before it was even found in Kansas. It had already been found in in Colorado. And here's Oklahoma, and we'll zero in on that a little bit, and we can see uh, that it is. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, well, it's around that Grand that Grand Lake area, um, Delaware County, and it's just one. It's just one beetle so far that's been found um, in that that October 2016. It was found on a purple panel trap, which is one means of of trying to uh, monitor and, and trap for these beetles. So that's all we've found so far in Oklahoma. Um, so here is kind of what's at risk. Here's the native range of all of our uh, North American ash species on the continent. And um, we can see that there is, there's areas here uh, on this map uh, where, where, where ash exists that emerald ash borer has not been detected yet, but is certainly um, under scrutiny and, and under, you know, there's, there's lots of, of worry uh, and, and, and effort in trying to detect it so it doesn't become a problem in those areas. The problem with emerald ash borer um, so again, with Oklahoma, we just have that one find. The problem is, um, and this has been repeated throughout the history of this invasion, we usually find new infestations several years after they've been there. So again, that re recall that lag period um, where the initial introduction into a, a new area, um, that applies for even new populations that are established in new areas within that invaded continent, that it, within those borders. So uh, Colorado, for instance, that infestation hadn't been found uh, for several years after the initial introduction of the beetle. So it kind of lies low for a while um, in the background and nobody notices it until we start to see uh, dying trees. I think we got lucky with the one in Oklahoma, um, finding, the, finding those on purple panel traps due to our monitoring. But, you know, I would bet my last dollar that there are other populations in Oklahoma that we just haven't detected yet. So that's the bad news. And again, as I mentioned, um, this is a little uh, comic that I found uh, just kind of uh, exemplifying this problem that we have um, uh, primarily with firewood movement um, where the beetles are, the larvae are viable inside that uh, that harvested wood uh, for, for up to a year or more and uh, they can complete their development still in that firewood. So if we take it with us and don't burn it and we just leave it, um, that's a new population that's that's destined to start in that area. They'll fly off and find um, living ash trees there to to attack. All right, so a little bit about the life cycle. Um, so from late May through September, uh, the adults begin to emerge from their trees. So all during that time span, we may have adults emerging from, from trees. And the males and females mate, of course, and then those females are going to lay eggs. And we can see here, um, um, so through June th through September, all that time they're laying eggs. And um, from those kind of reddish brown eggs, we see that first instar larva that emerges and then it's gonna tunnel its way immediately through the bark and into that tree and begin feeding. So that's happening all through June uh, up until September. And all during that time, they're feeding and developing and getting larger. There are four larval instars or, or size classes, stages of development, uh, first, second, third, and fourth instar, the largest being uh, right here where I've got my, I've got my cursor. And so that they're feeding and growing uh, and developing all the way through October. And then um, once October hits and the weather starts to change, um, they start to go into what we call diapause. It's a form of essentially hibernation um, where they form pre-pupae uh, through the months of November and then all the way through the winter. And then as spring approaches, uh, their, their development continues. Um, they progress into full pupation and then ultimately they, um, they become adults and make their way out of that tree again, completing the life cycle. So this is a this is a one-year life cycle, primarily. Although with emerald ash borer, we do have certain a certain percentage of the population that may wait two years to emerge from a tree. And in very rare cases, um, it's even been documented that uh, some beetles may wait even three years for, for whatever reason um, to, to emerge from, from a tree. So, so typically it's a one-year life cycle, but we can have a few exceptions or it might be longer. And what do we look for? Um, so with Emerald Ash Borer, um, the first thing that we tend to 
uh, see as a pro that uh, that there is a problem is is canopy dieback. We start to see um, it's not defoliation. This is uh, the branches and limbs are beginning to die out. They're uh, they're getting cut off from uh, the movement of, of nutrients and water. And so as a result, they start to thin. We start to see this, especially in the upper third of the canopy. So this picture on the left-hand side, we start to see that canopy thinning. And this progresses all the way through 100% dieback. So ultimately death of the tree. Um, it just becomes, uh, it just gets choked out. It's, um, it's strangled. Um, we might also notice uh, the development of epicormic shoots, these adventitious growths. Uh, so as the canopy is, uh, is dying back, uh, that tree is still struggling to try to produce photosynthate, right? Produce its own food. So um, it'll send out these adventitious shoots, these epicormic shoots from the bark, uh, sometimes even up from the roots. Um, you'll, you'll start to see these growths, um, um, these, these, these shoots that are forming uh, as they're trying to put more leaves out to, uh, to compensate for what's being lost in the canopy. So that's another uh, symptom. Uh, signs and, and, uh, and symptoms include bark splitting um, around the area where the, the trees are. Um, our North American trees, they don't have they don't have enough genetic resistance built into them to deal with this problem. This is a new invader. It's a, it's a, um, they did, the beetle and our North American species of trees did not co-evolve with one another. So it's a novel relationship and our trees do not know how to cope with these beetles and these beetles ultimately overwhelm the tree. But the trees, at least initially, um, they have a generalized wound response. So as they're under attack initially, they are tr attempting to wall off those beetles. Uh, so physically and chemically, they, they try to, um, to, try to uh, attack the, the beetle that's, that's feeding within the, the tree. And um, we'll get this, uh, this periderm tissue, this corky uh, layer that starts to build up physically around that wound site. And that's what can lead to this bark splitting on the outside of the the tree. So, so if you look into those bark splits, you'll start to see another um, sign of of uh, the of the attack, and that's the serpentine feeding galleries. And I'll, I've got a good picture of that coming up here in just a minute. Oh, it's the next slide. So, the serpentine feeding galleries, very typical of our metallic wood boring beetles, our jewel beetles, those flat headed borers. This is the kind of damage that they cause. We see this uh, this the 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 feeding gallery is kind of winding back and forth in the serpentine uh, pattern. Okay, so that's definitely um, that's definitely a, a significant uh, sign that we have emerald ash borer. If this is an if this is indeed an, an ash tree, if you find that on your ash tree, um, that is definitely a, a, a significant uh, diagnostic sign that we have emerald ash borer in that tree. Same thing with D-shaped exit holes. So the adults, when they emerge from the tree, they leave behind these distinctly D-shaped exit holes. They have a, a flat edge to them. And there are no native species, no native flat-headed borers in North America that attack ash. And so if you see D-shaped exit holes on any ash trees, that again is a diagnostic sign that we have, um, that we have emerald ash borer, okay? It's the only species that uh, in the flat-headed borer group that attacks ash trees. Woodpeckers can be an early indication of a problem as well. When we get increased um, woodpecker attacks, um, it may start out in this kind of blonding that we see here where they're kind of flecking away a lot of that outer bark. Um, and then of course, erupting into full um, attacks into that wood uh, as they try to remove those, those, those emerald ash borer pupae and larvae that are in, in the tree. So we see these, these large gaping holes where the woodpeckers have been um, excavating and and, and getting that protein source for themselves. And so lots of different woodpecker species, including downy, hairy, red-headed, red-bellied woodpeckers um, working these trees. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about woodpeckers later when we talk about biocontrol. Um, so natural control of, of emerald ash borer from, uh, from our birds, our native bird species. There are a lot of um, emerald ash borer lookalikes out there. So um, as an extension specialist, um, one thing that um, we have to be aware of is that people um, who are not familiar with insects as, as much as a professional entomologist such as myself, 
um, we're going to get a lot of mistaken identities, right? We're going to get a lot of phone calls, um, a lot of emails with pictures sent in from folks that, uh, that think they have Emerald Dashboard. They swear they have it. And indeed, what they're actually sending us is something like green June beetles, caterpillar, the fiery caterpillar hunters here, um, even metallic wasps sometimes are mistaken, um, green tiger beetles, Japanese beetle, another invasive exotic species. Most of these are natives here, um, except for Japanese beetle. So, you know, any basically the, the public at large starts to think it's green, it has to be emerald ash borer. Well, there are a lot of green insects, shiny green insects out there. So, um, so that it, we have to go beyond just the color to, uh, to definitively identify these critters. All right, what about management? So I've already talked a little bit about tree removal and restoration. That was the initial um, eradication protocol, um, trying to remove as much of the food source in an infested area as possible um, in an attempt to prevent further spread. The problem is the beetles are always a few years ahead of us. So they've already naturally kind of flown off and spread from those areas that we're now focusing our removal efforts. And so that's why the eradication effort was abandoned. It just it wasn't working. The beetles were too far ahead of, of our efforts to try to contain and eradicate. Um, so when it comes to removal and restoration, of course, we're, tra we're talking about um, disposal, of, disposal of that ash material in a, a responsible manner to prevent further spread. But, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, this is, this is good, valuable lumber. So um, there's efforts to try to get value added products out of those ash trees that we're harvesting. Um, and then ultimately we're talking tree replacement. And um, one thing I'll, I'll try to, you know, since this is a, you know, uh, the nursery industry that I'm talking to today, one thing that we really try to, um, the message, one, one message we really try to get across to folks, um, to landscapers, uh, to, to nursery industry folks, is um, when we're replacing trees, um, try to go for diversity. Um, the, the rule is about a 10, what we call a 10% rule. So try to, plant a land, a particular landscape that we're planting trees in no more than 10% of a particular species. So one of the biggest problems with emerald ash borer, we saw it also again with Dutch elm disease and chestnut blight in previous decades is we have this large monoculture, essentially these large stands um, that are planted in cities and, and other um, urban areas in, 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 you know, that are do dominated by one species. And when that happens, we're asking for trouble when these invasive insects, these invasive disease organisms uh, come in and attack these trees. We, we end up losing, you know, millions of trees as a result. So, so try, to, try to plant no more than 10% um, of one particular species. That's, that's kind of what we, we strive for. So more diversity in the landscape. So that in the event of future invasions, we don't have as bad of a of a problem. Okay, it's it's a bit easier to tackle. So, in addition to that, those physical removal strategies, we have biological control. I'll give you some data here showing some efforts there. Um, we also have host plant resistance. I'm not going to talk about today because um, we're we're still. This is a very long um, time frame for for research into f um, finding resistance and. Um, and, and getting that resistance, building that resistance into um, either new cultivars, new hybrids, um, or, um, or through gene introgression into our particular species. Um, so, so GMO, basically trying to um, genetically modify um, some of our, our ash trees to try to, uh, pr to try to protect them um, so they don't go extinct. So lots of efforts going on there. I, I don't have any data to really share with you much on that front today. Um, and then there's chemical control. So we'll kind of cover uh, uh, some of the chemicals that are available for treatment, both in the nursery as well as in the landscape. So as far as biological control, um, for parasitoid species, um, so these are parasitic wasps. Um, these are natural enemies of emerald ash borer um, that have been identified in Asia, the native range of emerald ash borer. So these are these are uh, natural enemies that have co-evolved with, with this beetle, um, you know, over millennia. And uh, we know that, uh, and, and after doing research in these foreign areas, um, we know that they attack emerald ash borer and they likely contribute to keeping emerald ash borer as uh, a, basically a non-pest status in Asia. Um, they, they don't have the problem we have with emerald ash borer because it evolved there. It co-evolved with their trees. So their trees have 
native resistance, genetic resistance built into them. And there are natural enemies that have evolved with these beetles um, and, and use them as a food source as uh, attacking them um, um, through evolutionary history as well. So, so these are four that have been identified and brought into the US in under quarantine and studied to make sure that they themselves are not gonna become a problem um, because there's always a danger with that, right? Of introducing intentionally um, new species, even for, for a good cause, um, like biocontrol of emerald ash borer. Um, so, so these have been studied extensively and determined that they're not a threat to, uh, to, to any of our native, um, our native wood boring species would be the issue. So, um, so these are the four species um, shown here, um, Tetrasticus planipennis, uh, Planopenisi, uh, Spathius agrilii, Spathius gallini, and Oobius agrilii. Agri um, and since 2017, so these releases, there's been millions of these, these wasps released in infested areas in these infested zones. And as of 2017, the latest data that I could find, over 3 million parasitoids have been released in 25 states where emerald ash borer occurs and into Canada. And I'm going to show you some data here showing that this is not just a, a pie in the sky approach. Um, so what we have here are, um, is the parasitism rate um, of emerald ash borer um, after um, these wasps were released into areas. Um, and that's in these green bars we see for two for three years, 2013, 2014, and 2015. One species in particular, the Tetrasticus planipenisi. Um, we see increasing parasitism rates um, over time in the green bars. That's the areas where they're released. But also importantly, we have control sites where no wasps were released. They also see parasitism by this species um, in those areas of non-release. So this tells us that um, the, the wasps are, are able to spread on their own. So we don't have to continuously make releases uh, to try to gain a foothold on emerald ash borer populations. So, so that's good news. They, they spread out from that initial area of, re, of release and we're seeing increasing parasitism rates um, of emerald ash borer uh, larvae and pre uh, from these uh, from this particular wasp in particular. And of course, again, there's, there's several others that I mentioned earlier that are being released as well. Here's the data for, um, I don't know which species this is for, um, but this is just showing a reduction in, um, in emerald ash borer larvae um, for, uh, again, these release sites and these control sites. So, um, so the releases began in, in 2008, and we see initially just increasing numbers of emerald ash borer larvae. It takes a little while for these natural enemies to find and, and, and uh, start regulating these pest populations. Um, but over time, we see through 2010, a little bit of a blip upwards in 2011. But since 2012 onward, we're seeing fewer and fewer emerald ash borer larvae in these areas of both release and control. Again, the, the wasps are spreading out into other areas and, so, and, 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 and regulating the emerald ash borer populations there. So, so we are. So this is this is hopeful, right? We're we're seeing some good data uh, coming out from these release areas of these uh, these biological control agents, these parasitic wasps for uh, emerald ash borer management. So of the four parasitoids released, um, T, uh, the the Planopenisi, T Planopenisi, the one I just shown you some data for, um, it's been established in multiple states. It's estimated to be spreading at about one or more kilometers per year. So that's good. Um, Spathius agrilii um, is not established in northern states. It has a very low uh, cold tolerance. Um, so this might be one uh, that's more promising for areas like where we live, where we have more mild winters. Um, a related species, Spathius gallini, currently being released. This one is cold tolerant, so it's being released um, in further north of us. Um, and then the, there's an egg parasitoid that attacks the eggs of emerald ash borer, that Oobius agrilii established in multiple states as well. So these efforts are ongoing. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are other biotic agents at play uh, that help to maintain emerald ash borer. And so um, in addition to these non-native parasitoids that have been released, studies have been looked at for um, our native natural enemies here in North America that may be finding emerald ash borer as a viable food source. So woodpeckers, I mentioned earlier, an early sign that we may have emerald ash borer if they're attacking our ash trees um, with, some, um, with some frequency. 
um, woodpeckers can have been shown to consume up to 57 percent of those the, the last instar stages those larvae those fourth instars as well as pupae native parasitoid wasps we even have some it's a novel association um, so again, there's no evolutionary history, but some, some native parasitoids are finding emerald ash borer as a viable host to attack, um, um, upwards of 18% parasitism right there. Um, and then of course that host plant resistance, um, there's a lot of promise in that area also, um, particularly with finding, um, some genetic resistance, even among, uh, our native ash species. So, um, just certain sports that um, are naturally occurring um, in this in these invasion in these invaded areas that have withstood emerald ash borer. They've been able to survive in the face of it. You know, everything else, all the other trees around them have died, but they are just essentially they're the genetic freaks that just have this particular mutation, whatever it may be. We're not quite sure at the genetic level yet but it's something that has some promise that we might be able to breed into um, our other native ash species to try to get some genetic resistance. And of course there's hybridization, there's, um, and there's other methods um, that we can try to um, look at host plant resistance. Again, I, there's not enough time to really get into that data today, but, but a lot of hope is on the front um, for, for managing this pest. It just takes time. Research, science takes time. So, so what about chemical control? So, you know, the questions focus on how to treat, when to treat, how often to treat, um, you know, um, so methods include soil injection or drenches, trunk injections, um, or sprays of contact insecticides uh, to, the, to the bark or the foliage. Um, treatments can vary. It could be early to late spring, or it could be the mid fall when we uh, make these recommendations to treat our ash trees. How often to treat, it's going to vary with material and the method of, of, of treatment as well. Um, so so we'll, we'll kind of go over some of these, uh, these aspects as we talk about what's available. We're going to focus on professional products since that's the audience. Of course, there are homeowner products that folks can use on their own, primarily in the realm of soil drenches, um, using primarily imidacloprid and dinatepuran, two um, um, neonicotinoid insecticides that have systemic um, um, activity. So we have, um, so again, active ingredients in the professional product line, um, both of those um, are, are listed here, imidacloprid and dinatefuran as well. Um, a number of products. Um, right now, um, what's shown on this slide are just the soil injection or drenching uh, methods. So these are the products that we can look for, uh, for those. Um, so we, we do have a, a number of these at our disposal. Um, for both um, nursery and landscape use. Um, it may vary from one of these, you know, from, from one product to another here as to where you can use them. But, but this is just generality, general speaking. These are what we have at our disposal for soil injection using something like a curet soil injector um, or drenching, just mixing up in, in water in a bucket and drenching um, or for um, or chemigation possibly as well in a, in a nursery environment. Um, and then the recommended timing is going to vary with these products as well. Generally, we're speaking uh, springtime, um, but, but some um, like Zytect can actually be um, uh, injected into the soil or drenched um, all the way into the fall. We have a few uh, trunk injection products. Um, so this is primarily for the landscape uh, market here. So landscape professionals using a wide variety of different um, uh, products out there for tree injection. Um, so we have um, active ingredients, including um, azadiractin. It's uh, uh, related to neem oil, essentially, um, same, same chemical uh, group. Um, we have imidacloprid, again, that can be trunk injected. Um, and we also have products that contain um, a very promising active ingredient, amamectin benzoate. Um, this one's been shown, uh, the product is called triage. This product has been shown to um, provide upwards of two, possibly even three years of protection. Um, so this is data coming out of Michigan, um, where, you know, the initial site of the invasion, so there's been a lot of work coming out of that state, um, research at Michigan State University and elsewhere. Um, so triage has been shown with to have a lot of promise. The, the advantage with triage is that um, it can provide protection for two or, or maybe three years with just one trunk injection. Some of these others, you have to go back every year and make these trunk injections into the tree. So, um, so there's, you know, some folks are concerned with 
that frequency of, of making those injections um, into trees, um, causing some, some physical harm to the tree as a result. Um, but uh, triage, you know, kind of, uh, kind of alleviate those fears a little bit, those worries, uh, because it's, it's not done with such frequency. And you get really good protection, um, upwards of nearly 100% uh, control of emerald ash borer in those trees. And these applications are made mid to late spring after the trees have leafed out. Uh, with the bark sprays, so these are systemic materials. Once again, um, it's, it's, the, these are all dinotefuran products. Again, the, um, the neo, one of those neonicotinoid products um, where they're applied to the bark. Sometimes they're tank mixed with a penetrant, a bark penetrant, um, to allow them to, to penetrate through that bark material a little more easily, but sometimes not. Um, data has been shown just simply spraying this, um, these products onto the trunk um, into the bark, they can penetrate through that bark and then get translocated through the tree systemically. Um, and these applications are made uh, mid to late spring again after the leaves have, uh, the trees have leafed out. So they've come out of dormancy. And then um, primarily this would be for, well, for both landscape, but also in the nursery uh, uh, industry uh, for protecting um, the outer surface of the trees through contact insecticides. Um, these include our pyrethroid-based insecticides, many of which you're probably already using already for, uh, for, for other species, for other insects. Um, uh, and then also um, carbamates like carbar uh, carbaryl-7 uh, can be used in this way. So, excuse me, these are primarily preventive applications um, applied to the trunk, branches, and sometimes even the foliage. Um, and usually two applications are made at four-week intervals. And um, the first spray should be made between 400 and 450 and 550 degree days. Um, and that's a base 50 degree model. And the degree days are counted starting January 1st. So those of you that are using um, degree days rather than calendar sprays, uh, we highly recommend using degree days, um, especially for emerald ash borer. Um, that's, that's what we would, uh, that's what's being recommended right now. Now, some caveats though, because Oklahoma, we've only got that one find. So don't get too bent out of shape yet and worried about, you know, having to make applications uh, for any ash trees that you may have uh, in your nurseries or in your landscapes, because there are some things to keep in mind. Um, so trees exhibiting, trees exhibiting more than 50% canopy dieback are unlikely to recover with insecticide treatment. So um, I worked on the species when I was a postdoc up at Michigan State before I started uh, my career here at OSU. Um, and um, I was involved in some of this early work um, looking at these insecticides. And, and basically um, what was found was with these systemic materials, if the canopy dieback exceeds 50%, there's just too much of the vascular tissue that's compromised that enough of that material that we're either drenching into the soil or applying in other ways, it's not getting moved through the tree. Um, too much of that vascular tissue has been compromised by the, by the larvae. Um, so so there, it's just, it, it's a lost cause at, beyond that point. But we have shown that, fit, that less than 50% canopy dieback, we can bring those trees back. There's enough um, vascular tissue that remains intact that we can still bring them back from, from ultimately the dead. Um, that uh, by, by making those treatments. Trunk injections are the most rapid systemic treatment. They get into the, trunk, uh, into the vascular tissues much faster than any other method, um, but this assumes adequate soil moisture and moderate air temperature and humidity. So the conditions have to be right in order for these trunk injections to work. So definitely keep your eye on the weather patterns. Um, <clears throat> here's the caveat for Oklahoma. Trees that are located within 10 to 15 miles of an active emerald ash borer infestation are at risk and should be treated. So what does that say for Oklahoma? Well, we only have that one find. We only have that one known area where emerald ash borer has been found. That would be the only area then around Delaware, Delaware County, uh, around Grand Lake, um, where trees um, may be treated, okay? I'm trying to, um, to, to knock out what might be already active in other ash trees in that area, in a 10 to 15 mile radius around that area. And that's it. So, um, you know, the rest of Oklahoma, we are not recommending insecticide treatments yet. We don't know where else this, this um, insect is occurring. 
So right now it, it would be a, a waste of product and time and effort and money to be treating um, ash trees everywhere else in Oklahoma, um, trying to prevent this because we just don't know where it is yet. So, um, and so the, again, the good news is we only have that one area and, and, um, and efforts have continued to monitor and look for it, but, uh, and, and looking for signs and symptoms that I went over earlier uh, of infestation, but, um, but there's no need to treat if you're um, not within that 10 to 15 mile area um, where that infestation is occurring. But this means we do need to be vigilant and continuously monitoring uh, the condition of ash trees in our area. So, you know, our normal operations, if we're landscape operators, um, going out into the landscape, looking at the condition of those ash trees and making sure that, um, you know, looking for those signs and symptoms that we just covered today, making sure they're not, you know, looking at the canopy uh, dieback situation. Is there dieback there? Um, is there bark splitting? Um, you know, and worse yet, are we seeing, you know, definitive diagnostic uh, uh, problems like uh, like uh, or indications of emerald ash borer, like the D-shaped exit holes, for instance, and those serpentine galleries below the bark. So, so be vigilant, stay aware, stay informed, uh, but and continuously monitor for the problem. Um, you folks, the, the, the um, nursery and landscape operators are the boots on the ground, right? You're the folks that are you know, intimately involved with these trees more so than I am. So um, we do rely on you to let us know when there's a potential problem. So again, keep current on the distribution of emerald ash borer here in Oklahoma. So check with ODAF, uh, check with the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service um, and, um, and stay, stay alert and stay informed. All right, how am I doing on time here? Well, we've got 10 minutes. So we're gonna try to try to get through um, Asian longhorn beetle here, just the, the second species of the day. Good news is this one is not in Oklahoma, it's nowhere near us, but it's a, again, as, uh, as tree care specialists, um, it, you folks are the ones that will be, um, ma, um, you know, first coming in contact with these, these potential problems. And so, you know, this is why education for you folks is of utmost importance because you're the boots on the ground. You're the ones that are um, gonna be able to alert us to any problems. Um, you'll, you'll be the first ones to know. So that's why, that's why hopefully you're, you're taking something home from, from this talk today. So Asian longhorn beetle, another beetle wood boring pest that has made its way to North America. So history and scope, just briefly, introduced accidentally, just like emerald ash borer, in solid wood packing material shipped from Asia. So this is another Asian um, wood boring species that um, came over in that, that solid wood packing material. First discovered in Brooklyn, New York in 1996, um, discovered on hardwood trees there. Um, and subsequently was found that it had spread to Long Island, uh, to Queens, as well as Manhattan uh, in New York. Um, in, 90, in 1998, two years later, a separate infestation, so this was not spread from New York to Chicago, this was just a separate introduction in woodpacking material, um, was discovered in Chicago in that, in two years later, in 1998. And then later discoveries, New Jersey was found in uh, 2002, um, and again in 2004. Uh, Staten Island and Prawls Island in New York, 2007. Massachusetts for the first time came on the map, uh, 2008. Um, so it, it was found in those areas that had been shown to be spreading. Um, it was declared eradicated from Chicago as well as Jersey City in 2008. So this is this is an interesting one. Um, this we do have some success with eradication efforts, tree removal, cutting down, you know acres and acres, um, you know, many, many city blocks of trees. Mm -hmm. So denuding those landscapes, unfortunately, if they have a lot of um, hardwood trees, particularly maples, um, one of, one of um, the favorite host trees for, for this species. Um, so, you know, you have to eliminate all those, those food sources, but it was successful in certain areas, um, uh, in, uh, in particular for this species, not so for emerald ash borer. The difference, emerald ash borer is a lot more mobile um, it, it flies much greater distances. It's a sm much smaller beetle, so it's a, it's a better flyer. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, these are larger. We'll see some um, size references here in a minute. These are much larger kind of lumbering beetles. They don't fly very far. Um, so that biology, that works to our advantage in trying to limit the spread of this particular species. 
Now, another new infestation was just found late summer here, uh, not here in Oklahoma, but in uh, in South Carolina in uh, 2020. So just just a, a month or two ago. So I have a colleague at Clemson um, uh, who is uh, who's now in the thick of trying to work on on eradication efforts, containment efforts for Asian longhorn beetle there in in the state of South Carolina. Preferred hosts are um, they're hardwood species. So um, ash, unfortunately, so double whammy, emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle will feed on ash. But um, um, whereas um, emerald ash borer is pretty much contained only to ash trees, um, there are a couple others that's been found to, to attack, but it's really ash that's the most uh, serious and most highly preferred food source. With Asian longhorn beetle, they'll feed on, a, on, on several others, including birch, elm, um, even golden rain tree, they've been shown to attack. Uh, sycamores and, and London plane trees. Maples, again, some of their favorites. The list goes on. Um, horse chestnut and buckeye. Um, Katsura. Um, there's mimosa has been shown. Uh, sorbus, mountain ash. Poplars and willows. These are all viable host trees, um, preferred host trees for Asian longhorn beetles. So we have a wider range of tree species to be on the lookout for uh, with, in particular with this particular beetle. A little bit about the biology, like uh, emerald ash borer, um, Asian longhorn beetles uh, progress through one generation per year. Um, although we did mention there's a couple exceptions with emerald ash borer, taking a bit longer to develop, but maybe two years to complete a life cycle. Um, but one generation per year with Asian longhorn beetle. Um, adults are seen from July through October, so they're emerging from their, their host trees uh, during that time frame. Um, the beetles typically remain on that natal tree, that tree they developed within. Um, so they, they, they may remain there, um, mate, lay eggs right in that same tree, but they may disperse short distances. Um, and again, these are not strong flyers, so they won't go very far, but they might find another tree in the neighborhood that they find as a, um, as a good food source and they'll attack it. Females can lay anywhere from 35 to 90 eggs during um, her lifetime. So each female that's out there, that's their egg, that's their um, maximum egg load. Um, and then the larvae feed under bark for a little while, uh, much like emerald, emerald ash borer, which always feeds just under the bark surface. But with Asian longhorn beetles, the, um, the, the larvae, what we call round-headed borers, they tunnel deep into the tree. Um, they, they tunnel much deeper and that's where they pupate. So they're, they're gonna be down into that, uh, in, um, ultimately down into that heartwood of the tree, um, um, potentially. Um, and here's the kind of the general size of the beetle. Um, you can see, so the adults, we, they belong to a, uh, the family Cerambicidae. Um, they, uh, and the, the, the common name for that family are the longhorn beetles, um, not because they're Texas longhorn fans, it's because they have um, these really long antennae in reference to the length of the body, okay? Males in particular, um, more than females, male, females have long antennae too, but the males have just some extreme, extremely long antennae um, uh, associated with them. So, um, so anyway, that's what we call the, the, the adults. They're, the adults are longhorn beetles, and this is just one um, exotic invasive species. We, we have many longhorn beetle species that are native to North America um, that, that attack our trees too. But uh, this is just a general size reference. Um, so um, the, the, um, the males are much smaller than the females. Um, that's typical for the insect world. Females are the ones carrying the eggs, right? So the females are gonna be kind of the big bruisers uh, in the insect world. They're gonna be much larger uh, than the males. Um, they also get, I'll just say it here, they also get the, na the nickname, the, the Starry Night Beetle. Uh, so think Van Gogh's famous painting, uh, The Starry Night. Um, the, uh, the pattern of the, the coloration on the, on the elytra, these wing covers of these beetles, is reminiscent of um, Starry Night, the, the painting. So they, they do get that nickname as well. So preventing spread. So just like with emerald ash borer, quarantines are established in those areas where uh, where new new infestations are found, trying to prevent further spread. Um, eradication cuts are likely more successful again uh, for this species than emerald ash borer due to its short flight ability. 
regulated regulated articles are the same thing that we talked about with emerald ash borer, right? Any of those pro those harvestable products from trees for those hardwood species, and then the, the species themselves, right? There, if the, if there's a nursery in that quarantine zone, um, they they're really SOL, right? There's there's not much they can do. There's a lot of hardwoods that they cannot move off site. So nursery stock is a big one. That's a big problem for the nursery industry in these areas. Fortunately, um, not many nurseries have been in areas where um, Asian long longhorn beetles have been found. It's been primarily um, urban areas. Um, and uh, with the, the latest one in South Carolina, that's been, um, interestingly, it's been more of a kind of a um, native, uh, native uh, forest stand primarily has been, been affected there. So uh, what to look for, um, the, the, the symptoms and signs associated with Asian longhorn beetle, unfortunately, are not as kind of cut and dry as we see with, with emerald ash borer. Um, but like a lot of longhorn beetles, the females um, will chew out some of these, what we call overposition niches. It's where they lay their eggs. That's what overposition means. It's, it's placing an egg, literally laying an egg. So they'll chew these areas out and lay their egg in those niches. Um, and then their exit holes are, are pretty large. They're, they fit within a dime. I mean, that's not huge, right? But it's, it's definitely noticeable um, with your naked eye. And, um, and they're round. Um, that's, that, that's typical for round-headed boars when the adults emerge uh, for, for a wide variety of species. They're either round or oval-shaped. With um, Asian longhorn beetle, they're definitely more round. Um, and, they're, and these are pretty large beetles. So, um, so, uh, so, so these are going to be fairly large, again, uh, just contained within the diameter of a dime. Like emerald ash borer has, has lookalikes, we do have um, Asian longhorn beetle lookalikes as well. Um, I would say that the two most common that are likely to be confused with Asian longhorn beetle, and these are species that do occur in Oklahoma and elsewhere, include our cottonwood borers. So, you know, you tree care specialists in Oklahoma are probably very familiar with this one. Very, very common wood boring species. You can, and, and they're about the same size. They're actually, um, cottonwood borers uh, slightly larger than Asian longhorn beetle. Um, but uh, um, you can see where the confusion would be easily made um, with the coloration on the elytra, on those wing covers, right? And the, and the patterning there. Um, it's very, very similar to Asian longhorn beetle. Um, <clears throat> What um, cottonwood borers do not have, though, is an alternating pattern of black and white antennae. And we definitely see that with um, Asian longhorn beetle. These, the segments have this alternating pattern of white and black coloration on the, uh, on the antennae. Um, another one are pine sawyer beetles. Um, we have a few species, genus Monochamus, um, um, a few species. These are the beetles that are responsible for, uh, for transmitting the nematodes that cause pine wilt in um, in our exotic uh, pine species. Um, so, uh, um, so these could also be potentially confused with Asian longhorn beetle. They're not quite as large, although the, the females of pine sawyer beetles could be as large as the males of Asian longhorn beetles. So size isn't necessarily a guarantee. And they're, again, their coloration of their, their elytra could be confused. And, and unfortunately, they do have that banding pattern, black and white alternating. Um, on the antennae. So, so I could see some confusion lying here as well. So it definitely pays, to, pays off to know your bugs, right? Know how to identify among at least these three species um, as you're kind of monitoring and looking out for Asian longhorn beetle. Um, management's gonna be the same, uh, really. Tree disposal, tree removal, it's been the same efforts being made for, emerald, uh, for Asian longhorn beetle as has been done with emerald ash borer. Um, other management strategies for Asian longhorn beetle are st still being researched. Um, um, so in the event that eradication efforts fail, um, but you know, luckily for this species, it seems like a lot of the eradication, tree removal and prevention of further spread, a lot of those efforts have been uh, successful. And so um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of effort in the other realms of research, but, 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 but it is ongoing um, just, just in the event that these eradication efforts do fail. All right, that brings me to the end of my talk today. Um, I don't know if we have um, too many people in the audience today, but uh, but if there's any questions, you can um, feel free to unmute yourselves if you're able to, or um, or type into the uh, uh, chat window. Um, we can try to uh, tackle a few of those questions uh, questions now.
Well, I guess I did a thorough job. <laughs> well, you have my contact information. It was at the beginning of the, uh, the it was on that first slide. Um, I'll just say it again now, my, my email address, um, eric, E-R-I-C dot Rebeck, R-E-B as in boy, E-K. So eric dot Rebeck at okstate.edu. And somebody did raise a hand. So let's see here. What is the likelihood of Grand Lake infestation spreading? Well, the likelihood is that if they found that one beetle there, it's likely already spread from there. Um, now, as I said earlier, they may have gotten lucky. That might have been just a straggler from um, the Arkansas population, the population of emerald ash borer that's been found in, um, in Western Arkansas. Um, but more than likely, I mean, Grand Lake area is a high recreation area. It's more than likely that that is a separate introduction, probably probably through firewood movement. It got there through a camping area, uh, fishing area, who knows. Um, and it's probably unfortunately um, already spread from there. And that's why we do need to be vigilant and, and be looking for it. So this has been the history of emerald ash borer. It's always, it's always one step ahead of us. We find it in an area, but it's already been there for several years and it has already um, spread and moved on from those, uh, from that, that, that new introduction point. So, so what is the likelihood? It's, it's likely that it's probably spread from there, unfortunately. Um, thoughts on the use of dormant oil to help prevent this pest? I'm assuming um, emerald ash borer and, and maybe, maybe just wood borers in general. Um, dormant oil is not going to work. That, that's a contact insecticide. I mean, it, it would work on eggs, but, um, you know, um, dormant oils are applied in the wintertime. Those eggs are not on the outside of the, uh, um, of the, uh, of the, of the tree during that time frame. So uh, dormant oil is not going to be a go-to uh, for, um, for, uh, for, protect, for, for protecting trees uh, from wood borers. Um, Justin said, I was hurrying. Sorry for the spelling. No, no worries. Uh, Ken says, um, Eric, any differences between white and green ash as far as vulnerability to to emerald ash borer uh, and grafted trees versus seed grown differences. Um, I can't speak um, regarding grafted trees, um, although that would be an area for um, if you, you grafted a tree onto resistant rootstock, um, which has been done for you know other plants. Uh, I, one that comes to mind is the grape industry. You know they they do that for uh, for for disease as well as insect management and grapes grafting onto um, resistant rootstock, but also hardy rootstock for for grapes. So, so that's an area I'm not quite sure if that's if there's been much work in the uh, graft versus versus seed grown uh, differences to emerald ash borer vulnerability. But I can speak to uh, white versus green ash. So one of the studies I was involved with as a postdoc at Michigan State um, did involve that. We we looked at at uh, you know how fast do trees succumb to emerald ash borer depending on their species, and we found that um, green ash goes much faster. It succumbs much faster to emerald ash borer than white ash. So, um, so some of the um, some of the cultivars we were looking at, we looked at a couple of green ash cultivars. Uh, Marshall seedless was one. Um, there was another one I can't remember. And then we looked at um, uh, a couple of white um, uh, white ones as well. Uh, white ash. And, and in, in the stand that we did, it was a common garden planting. We noticed that the green ash went much faster than the white. However, the white ash did eventually succumb. So our native ash trees, we have not found, any, um, in general, we have not found any species that are resistant or tolerant to emerald ash borer. They all do ultimately succumb uh, to this beetle. So they just, none of our native species have that genetic capacity to, to deal with, the, with, with mass attack from, from emerald ash borer. That's a good question. Um, Justin asks, are there climate controls for both these pests? I'm not sure what you mean by climate controls. Um, you know, plants growing outdoors, they're at the mercy of whatever climate they're growing in. So um, climate control in terms of maybe um, harvested material, it, maybe that's what we're trying to uh, get at with this question. So there's been work done at that, uh, you know, so different zones, uh, different growing zones. Um, yeah. Um, it, well, it's been spreading. It's been radially spreading north, south, east, and west, uh, emerald ash borer. Um, and when, when they look at its native range in Asia, 
Um, it, it seems to be doing just fine in, in the cold areas. Um, so it's a cold adapted species. It does, does well. Um, winter kill can affect the beetle. You can get some dying out uh, uh, beetles, uh, the larvae and, uh, and pupae that are in that tree during the winter. If it's a particularly very cold winter, uh, a long sustained few days of very cold temperatures, um, that's not gonna happen down here in Oklahoma. So um, very dry areas um, versus moist climates. Um, we could see uh, possibly limited spread um, in arid zones of emerald ash borer, um, but you know, I, I don't know. I don't think there's been enough. I don't think there's been enough uh, information out there, enough study, enough research looking at at that. Um, so, you know, I, I would just buckle down and be prepared. Um, so even that we're typically a, a more arid zone than than further north of us, uh, it's uh, it, it certainly could be problematic here as well. So. Um, and then Kenneth, can you explain the tools available to us to using degree day monitoring, please? Well, that's a that's a half hour talk in itself, Kenneth. Um, I would be happy to share with you um, on the side how to use degree days um, for monitoring. Um, essentially, there are a couple of different models that we can use uh, for degree day uh, calculations. Um, degree day, by the way, the, the, this came out of the, these these models came out of the horticulture industry for monitoring. Uh, plant development. So um, sometimes you'll see these um, called growing degree days, um, referring to, you know, how far the growth um, is advancing during a particular growing season for, for a particular tree or other plant. Um, it, it, the advantage of degree days versus calendar dates is that every year is different in terms of, um, in terms of the climate. So, you know, um, Spring may arrive earlier some years than others, and and so we so we can't always go by calendar dates to determine the best time to spray or the best time to um, take some activity against a certain insect pest or disease pest. So, um, so the advantage of degree days is it's based on heat units. It's accumulated heat units uh, through um, you know we typically track starting January first. So the accumulative heat units that are accumulating up to that point in the in the season starting January 1st um, it's going to be different one year to the next it's you know so so some you know some some winters are shorter if you will than others um, so so that's the advantage of, of growing degree days and I could definitely um, you know spend some time with you outside of this this talk um, just contact me via email um, and or, or over the phone and we can uh, and I can kind of uh, share with you. I've got, a, I've actually got a, a, a working model in Excel that I use, um, an, Excel, an Excel spreadsheet for, for tracking those. So, um, so contact me outside of this, uh, this session. Helder says, would you explain about the percent parasitism cited in the graphs? Yes, yeah, so that's, um, so if we, you know, the, the population that's monitored, what they do, percent parasitism, what they're looking at is of all of the larvae or the pupae that have been collected and observed, um, it's the percentage of those that have been parasitized by, by those um, wasps. And so the graphs showed from each year, they, they looked at a certain cohort of mm -hmm. their sample size of those larvae and, and pupae that were in those, um, in those trees. And they, they extracted them and they, and they looked for signs of, of parasitism from, uh, uh, from, from, the, the species of parasitoids that were released. So, you know, we saw it started, you know, maybe about 50% parasitism. And we saw that the, the overall percentage of that population of emerald ash borers that were, that were there, um, the percentage that were parasitized was increasing over time. So that tells us that, um, the, that the parasitoids are finding, um, they're finding these, these larvae, these pupae, and they're doing their, their job. Um, I, I hope I, I answered that question appropriately, but that's that's what's meant by percent parasitism, the percent of population that's that's a, that's occurring that's incurring uh, parasitism by those natural enemies. Lots of good questions, folks. Thank you. Keep me on my toes. All right. Well, that may that may be the end of our Q and A. So, um, so again, you can contact me outside of uh, uh, this this conference um, the, via email. Um, I didn't have my phone number listed, but uh, you can look me up on the on the interwebs there uh, 
just type in um, uh, Oklahoma State Entomology, you'll get to our department and you can find all, all contact information you need for, for myself and, and others in our department. So I appreciate your attention today. Again, great questions. Um, we're learning st new stuff all the time uh, with these invasives. So, uh, so stay tuned. We'll have uh, more information as the years progress regarding emerald ash borer.